Hey team, welcome our, to our discussion of conditions of vascular and lymphatic diseases. We are going to talk about fluids. Where does the juice go? Where does it stay put? Where do we not have enough of it? All sorts of different states in which we have fluid issues in the periphery, in other words, your arms and legs. So let's jump right in here. Here are the conditions we're going to cover. Okay, so Peripheral artery disease. This is probably one of the most common things that is underdiagnosed in the general population until it gets worse. So what we have here is not enough blood getting to the limbs. So this is quote unquote poor circulation. So one thing to keep in mind is that we have these plaques, right? And we've talked about them in the context of the heart. When they happen in the limbs, then the limbs experience the low blood flow issues, the sort, same sort of thing that we've seen in other structures of the body, but this one's going to have a slightly different manifestation. So the, the origin is almost always damage to the wall of the artery from plaques. Now you can have conditions that cause blood vessel wall inflammation, or it can be the result of radiation. So far, folks have had to have radiation therapies. But for the most part, the vast majority of your cases, it's going to be from atherosclerosis. So I do want you to be familiar with this epidemiology, that once someone crosses age 65, it affects men and women, both sexes, uh, equally. And in addition, 20% of people over age 70 have this condition, many of which are undiagnosed, mind you. So for those of you who are thinking of going into neuro, be aware that your strokes, your folks with stroke, probably have this condition. So be familiar with that. One of the big things you're going to hear me say repeatedly during our conversation on these vascular conditions is to take off their shoes and socks. The feet specifically reveal a lot of vascular conditions early on, and if you catch it early, you can really spare someone a lot of um, debility later in their life. For those of you who are also thinking of working with amputees, this is going to be a bread and butter condition for you. You're going to be very familiar with peripheral artery disease, so also sometimes called PAD or PAD. So what's actually going on? Well, some of the larger vessels are usually affected. This isn't so much a smaller vessel disease. This is a larger vessel disease. So we're talking the big ones, the ones that if you're working on a cadaver, you can stick your thumb in. Abdominal aorta, iliac, femoral, these huge ones. Femoral artery is also the most common site for emboli, mind you. So like stuff builds there and then it travels away. So what happens is slowly the plaque builds up over time, and early on the arteries can compensate for this buildup by just getting loose, dilating, and that preserves blood flow. But eventually the artery can't dilate anymore, and the plaque starts to narrow the flow, and that's when we enter a real problem. That's when a lot of people become more obviously symptomatic, but early on, if we're lucky, so this is an early on presentation, the hallmark sign can be pain to the lower extremities caused by walking and relieved with rest. It's that simple. You probably have family members who are older who complain of this and maybe don't have a diagnosis. This is me telling you, yes, they need to follow up with their PCP. Yes, it's that small, uh, um, a seemingly simple thing that actually can mean something quite serious. So this walking pain, what you're actually getting is demand ischemia of the muscles of the legs. Yes, that same condition that we learned regarding the heart. Now we're having a similar problem, but this time the tissue it's affecting is not cardiac, but the, skeleton, the musculoskeletal structures of the legs, so the muscles. So when you have walking pain, specifically that finding is called intermittent claudication and the pain decreases in rest. So if you have a patient or even someone you know who does not have a PAD diagnosis but does have this presentation, that means follow up with your PCP. It can also manifest with lower extremity cramping or fatigue. That's kind of like a gentler earlier sign. And then difficulty sleeping, and this is the classic one. I don't know, I've lost count actually of the number of folks that I have referred back to their PCP. Accurately, mind you, because they specifically, one of the, my favorite questions to ask is, what is the position you sleep in? Because it's, it tells you a lot of information. And so this population will dangle their lower leg at night to relieve the pain and that makes them feel better. So in class, we're gonna talk about why. So this is a gravity thing. Remember that this is a condition which affects the arteries, and in this population, they're experiencing low-grade ischemia, and that's why their pain occurs. Remember, ischemia burns, ischemia hurts. That's why you get angina. That's why you get intermittent claudication type pain, things like that. So if they're dangling their lower leg at night to relieve the pain in their feet, which they will often describe as being to the soles of the feet as burning, why would that help? Let's answer that question together during class. It's a good physio question. 
Okay, on physical exam, they're also going to have reduced pulses. So when you palpate for like dorsalis pedis and things like that, you're not going to be able to find it. And popliteal, which is always hard to find, you really won't find in this population. In addition, if you give gentle like palpation squeezes or anything like that to the limbs, they're going to wince and withdraw from you. They're going to go, ah, that kind of hurts. That, that's a classic one. One of the things I tend to do right off the bat when I'm working with a patient and outpatient is I ask them, I'm like, I know you don't want to pull up you know, your pant legs, but do you mind doing that? And I'm going to do a gentle squeeze on your leg. And when I do that, that's honestly me screening for PAD. Because again, I work in adult neuro rehab. Like <laughs> my population tends to be a little older. And so I have to screen. The leg tends to have less muscle on it. It tends to not have hair. And it tends to be pale depending on the person's skin tone. If it's more extreme, it's cold. And if, sometimes, usually you won't see this unless you have a severe condition. This is more hospital side. It might even be a little cyanotic. You can also have the presence of bruits. So this is something to keep in mind. So if you, again, you can find this on a patient with a known diagnosis or a patient with an unknown diagnosis. So when I used to do, when I help out with cardiopulm uh, practicals and the person doesn't take off, if they don't doff shoes and socks, I'm going to take points off. Yeah, yeah. You can put on gloves. That's fine. But you need to do this. This is part of good physical exam screening when you're a PT. Okay, so what, how does this happen? So smokers with PAD versus non-smokers with PAD, this is a fairly serious condition. So in fact, so much so that if you have PAD and you don't smoke, you're likely to live longer and hang on to your toes and your legs. If you do smoke, you are less likely to keep your toes and your legs and more likely to have a reduced lifespan. Why? Because smoking affects your vasculature. So it's creating two problems at the same time. So. Smoking it has so many multi-system effects, it's, it's absolutely wild to me um, how powerfully negative it is on the body. So basically, it's reducing blood flow even more in a system that's already damaged. So that's why a smoker with PAD is going to have a higher risk of losing limbs and a higher risk of reduced lifespan. Erectile dysfunction is also an early indicator of the disease. For an individual, if a patient is actually willing to have a more delicate conversation with you and they indicate an issue with erectile dysfunction, that, remember that the presence of an erection is partially a vascular thing, right? So if they are having PAD, it's reducing the blood flow which goes into the penis and that's why they're experiencing erectile dysfunction. So that's actually an early indicator. So for those of you who are willing to have those conversations with patients, or most, to be honest, most of the time the patient brings it up themselves, right? That's a lot of times an early PAD sign. Sometimes the condition can become more severe and poor perfusion of the nerves of the lower extremities can result, and that's also part of your rest pain, okay? So unfortunately, a really typical finding in this is a burning to the soles of the feet, which doesn't stop, so that's intractable. They also tend to have wounds that won't heal because there's enough blood flow to allow the good chronic inflammation mediators to come in and create healing. And so they also are prone to ischemic ulcers. So a person who's losing their mobility and has PAD is more likely to develop an ulcer to the skin, and then it's more likely to, to build into gangrene, right? So gangrene is an infection to those, those types of wounds. So this very rapidly becomes, um, unfortunately, a cascade that can lead to limb loss. So how do we try to catch this early? Well, an actual medical procedure, and one which you will probably learn your second year, is an ankle brachial index test or an ABI test. So this is where we actually take blood pressure of the arm and the leg, and the comparison of those blood pressures creates a ratio. So you divide the upper extremity by the lower extremity, and the number you get, that allows you to screen for the presence of different conditions of the arteries. If your ABI values are too low, that means there is enough blood flow, and that's one way that we can screen. If the numbers are way too high, then that's a concern that the arteries are too stiff, which is also, you know, other health conditions. So there's actually a happy medium for normal. Note that this procedure does not provide a source, like it doesn't tell you, oh, they for sure have this condition, that's what's causing your abnormal values. We still don't know. Again, it's a screener. And we don't know which vessels specifically have the reduced blood flow. So that's why we use this as a screen. Send them back to the PCP and have additional workup. So I do want you to know one value here. So when you get to your second year, you will learn more. But I do want you to know that on ABI testing, if the value is less than 0.9, they are at risk of PAD. So eventually you'll need to learn all of these numbers. And you can see here that normal is this happy range right here. And that when it's really low, 
like well below that 0.9 lower end of normal, that that's when we worry there's other claudication conditions. And if it's way too high, higher than that upper threshold of normal 1.3, then we're worried about the arterial wall stiffening. You can see that there is that kind of happy medium. But the only number I need you to know for this patho course is that below 0.9 on EBI is indicative of the likelihood of PAD testing. And this is unfortunately pretty accurate. Uh, I, I've seen this clinically and doing community health screenings. This is one of the community health screening procedures you may do. And this one tends to pop up. It's like, oh, you need to follow up with your PCP. So they'll also do blood work, they'll do a CT work, and they might do an MRA, in which they, they put a dye into your vasculature to see the health of it and the flow rates and things like that. But the big thing that we need to know as PTs is that ABI is part of our, our arsenal of things that we use as part of being primary care. Like not so much PCPs, but more like folks can come see us early, you know, they can come see us directly. So this is just part of our, our practice. So medications for this condition, they basically try to open up the vessels and try to help with keeping the vessels from getting worse. So a statin will prevent the atherosclerosis from advancing and a vasodilator will help open up the vasculature so that you can have um, better mm, symptom management. So it takes a hot minute for it to work, but at a lot of times this makes a big difference. The patient just has to be compliant with this. So we'll talk more about this when you come back to me in the summer for farm, but I do want you to be aware that the medications try to stop the process and they try to open up the vasculature. The surgical interventions here are exactly what you would think. They're actually pretty similar to what we do in the heart. So they try to open things up with a balloon angio. They place a stent in these big arteries to try and hold them open, or they go around the problem by doing a bypass graft. So same thing as in the heart, right? You've got a narrowing in the heart or a clot in the heart, balloon angio, stent, or a bypass graft, right? Just a different site for a similar logic of intervention. So here it is actually happening so you can see it, these huge bypasses, right? I mean, look at this, going around the issue, and sometimes they are absolutely massive. It's the entire limb as they go in and try to make things better. And here's a healed one, right, trying to go around it. So you can see this is the logic here. They're doing a stint and going around where the vasculature has become so narrow or it's just blocked. It's so, so narrow that it's effectively blocked. And what that does is it saves the limb. So let's just say hypothetically right here was where you had serious narrowing. You're going to lose everything south of that. So that's the logic here is by opening this up or going around it, you can save the limb. Sometimes they do a stint as well. But what we're really trying to do is save that person's limbs. Okay, so the logic here, what is the role of PT in this intervention? You're going to learn more about this your second year, but I'll go ahead and bring it to you a little bit because it kind of makes the patho make sense. So what you can try to do is build healthier vasculature and maybe get just a little bit of angiogenesis. And so that's from controlled walking. So you don't need to know this number right here. I just have it here for interest to show that it takes a while, right? You got to be consistent. It's small amounts often, okay? So we basically try to encourage a little bit of healthy vasculature to happen by not overdoing it, but ultimately a lot of what we're doing is also just building a little bit of pain tolerance. So you walk for a little bit, stop for a little bit and rest, walk for a little bit once the pain goes down. So that needs a PT because you're going to really help them, you know, encourage them to get past uh, a certain threshold, but not so much that they've overdone it and they're, they're in like extreme discomfort or pain. So Despite being really effective, um, supervised exercise programs are not usually covered, so you might need to hit it through a different angle, uh, which is actually really easy to do. So talk to me about that during class if you're interested in that. We find ways to get around uh, this barrier, which gets worse and worse all the time. So at any rate, we are actually very effective at helping in an exercise therapy logic with PAD to increase the person's ability to walk around and therefore prevent the problem from getting even worse, right? Okay, so now I want to hit the wounds that are classic for this. You're going to hit, these are challenging, they're, they're kind of detailed, and then the, the board exam really loves to ask these types of questions, right? This is low-hanging fruit, so that's why you're basically going to get this content twice, that's on purpose. You're going to get it with me your first year, and then again your second year when you take your integ class. Okay, so again, our pathophysiology is that you don't have enough blood flow, so you're basically getting tissue ischemia, right? So this is a very common finding when you have it doubled up with diabetes. So I spared you from the particularly gangrenous stuff because you're going to see plenty of that out in clinic. You're going to have these patients who first time they've ever come into the hospital is because they have um, a black and mummified limb or toe and the gangrene has really developed. So here's an example of an arterial wound. They have a really classic look. So I know, I told you there were going to be pictures. 
Okay, so this cluster of presentation findings on wound care is the thing that I was saying is doubled up. So with intention, we have wounds that occur to the legs, the ankles, the toes, particularly in between the toes. But note that I've got here an image of this happening on top of the toes, right? The color tends to be a dark red or yellow like this, grayish, or it gets black like in this previous one, like right here. There's no bleeding, because again, this is arterial. Not enough blood is getting there. That's how we ended up with, with the problem. So there's no bleeding in these ones. The borders, it's a punch out, and they're deep. Observe this one right here. It looks like it was just been punched out, right? Really clear borders, and it's kind of deep. They may or may not have pain, because the nerves are dying in this condition. So sometimes there's pain, sometimes there isn't. The skin nearby is dry, without hair. Hair requires blood in order to grow and so because they aren't getting enough blood flow the hair follicle dies it's shiny and tight and if you pick up the limb like if they're sitting there and they're dangling their legs and you pick up the limb and you straighten out that knee you extend it the leg will get will get pale depending on their skin tone and cool to the touch okay so this again follows in with they are dangling at night right? So be thinking again, why would they dangle at night given that this is an issue of arteries? Not enough blood flow is coming in. Now at night, if they have that leg propped up, like if they're actually laying flat supine on the bed, they'll get an aching pain, which goes away when they dangle, okay? So this particular image here is much earlier in the staging of the wound, and this kind of yucky whatnot here, this is called slough, so if those of you who are interested in wound care, this is very classic slough right here, okay? But notice that the skin here looks kind of shiny and tight. Um, this, is, this is pretty classic, okay? Okay, so what are some of the PT implications here? Well, they have pain with walking. They have paleness, depending again on skin tone when you elevate the limb. Venous filling is delayed once you do foot elevation. We'll talk about what that means during class because I have to demonstrate. And they are very, very, very classic for this finding. This is an iconic difference, okay? Dependency of ruber. It means that when you take the limb, let's say they're sitting and their feet are on the ground, you pick up the limb and you look at it, you're examining, and then you put the foot back down, it will flush red really fast when you return it to that dependent position. That is dependency of rubor, and that is a classic, iconic PAD finding. Gangrene to a toe is a red flag finding. You would think that you would not be the first healthcare provider to find gangrene, and yet you will be, especially for those of you who choose to work in a pro bono setting. I thankfully have only had to refer this um, I think I'm still in the single digits, but uh, not for long. <laughs> so many people explain away the problem. It's it's like a psychology thing they do, you know? And so they, they downplay how bad it is, and yet it can be very serious. So gangrene to a toe is a red flag finding that needs to go back. Someone needs to look at this. And then here is a really big safety thing. Compression stockings are not appropriate in this population. In fact, I would posit that you could get sued if you put compression stockings as a treatment option on a patient with PAD because it's going to make the condition worse. You are going to hurt them. Remember that not enough blood is getting down to the limb. So if you don or put on compression stockings, you're going to make that issue worse. So is this treatment a good intervention in this population? No. And yet, do you know how many times I have seen someone who was, oh God, this is classic, who has undiagnosed PAD who has gone to a non-licensed person and is wearing compression stockings. More times than one, let's put it that way. So this is something that you want to be on the lookout for. I'm not so much worried about y'all doing it because I've just scared y'all, but you will see, I mean, I hate to say this, but personal trainers, chiros, like alternative medicine folks, or just, you know, Joe Schmo recommends to their friend, oh, your legs hurt, put on compression stockings. They don't know. They mean well, they really do, but they don't know. You, however, are getting this training to know better, okay? All right, so um, let's go ahead and pause here, and we'll come back and we'll talk about this specific finding of intermittent claudication.